Hey, everyone. Today's show is going to be a little bit different than our normal program. So, in fact, it's nothing at all like our normal program. We're introducing a brand new podcast called the China Global South Podcast. Now, for those of you who've been following our newsletter and some of the changes that we've had on the site, this shouldn't come as a surprise, but we're super excited to be able to tell you all about this exciting new program. And we're really trying to fill what we think is a big void in the discourse about China and the world. And we're just so thrilled that when we were thinking about how to introduce the show to you, we said, hmm, Well, we could just talk for an hour. Well, that would be kind of boring. And then we were talking to our friend and our mentor, Kaiser Guo from the Seneca podcast and the China Project. And he said, hey, I'll host the show. So this week, incredibly, Kaiser Guo from the Seneca podcast is hosting the first episode with us to talk about the China Global South podcast. So, you know, a little bit more about the China Global South podcast. Um, as as you've seen over the last while, um, we've been mixing in a lot of a lot of kind of insights from other parts of the global South um, into our work on on China Africa relations. And and as we as we you know we've rebranded our newsletter to reflect our kind of global South broad kind of view. Um, but we didn't want to. We didn't want to stop talking about Africa. You know, we we keep talking about Africa always. For us, Africa is the heart of the global south. But we know that some people really want to hear just about Africa, and other people want to hear about just about the rest of the world. So we essentially have uh, we we split them off into into the China and Africa podcast and the China Global South podcast. They're going to be um, appearing on separate feeds, but but if uh, if you are if your feed is the China Africa podcast, you will also receive it in your China Africa podcast feed. Um, and we we're going to be talking uh, we're going to be taking a very similar approach as we have with the China and Africa podcast in that we're going to be talking about all aspects. We're going to be focusing on people um, and experts from the impacted countries, trying to get many of them who are who are resident in the impacted countries, and also building building bridges between between academia and and you know kind of and normal people. Um, so you know kind of so we're going to be focusing similarly on a very broad range of issues um, from climate to media to geopolitics to um, to development um, and we are, we're going to be focusing on on regions throughout the global south so mainly that would be Africa always Latin America and South America the Caribbean uh, Southeast Asia South Asia um, Western Asia and the Middle East and Central Asia um, with uh, some visits to Oceania as well um, so you know kind of it's going to be a, a really kind of interesting fun mix of things um, drawing on insights from India from Indonesia from Argentina etc 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 like you know kind of it's, we, we're going to try and kind of like cast the, the net as wide as possible So let's now take a listen to the first episode of the China Global South podcast, and today featuring our special guest host, Kaiser Guo. I'm Kaiser Guo, coming to you from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Today, I am delighted to introduce the latest show on the Seneca Network, the China Global South podcast. And to chat with the creators and co-hosts, our good friends, Eric Olander and Kobus von Staden, who are, of course, the co-founders of the China Global South Project. Uh, so we've got a joint podcast for you today, a crossover show, you might say, to introduce the China Global South Podcast. And guys, welcome and congratulations, first off, on the new show. We are very, very excited to go to launch. Thank you so much, Kaiser. Awesome to be back on the show with you and just honored that you are with us to help introduce this new exciting project. Thanks so much. Yeah, lots and lots to talk about. First of all, I guess the the obvious question is, you know, hey, they say if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, Your show, the China in Africa podcast, which has been running as long as Seneca, you know, 12, 13 years getting on, it does really impressive traffic. If I may just sort of boast for a second here, consistently one of the top performers in the network, Uh, really just in easy number two. And and I see the stats every week. So, you know, people are definitely tuning in to the China and Africa podcast twice a week. Why did you guys decide to split it into two then? We're, we're super proud of 
the China and Africa podcast and grateful to the amazing support that we've gotten for more than a decade now from you and from the listeners and just from everybody around the world who who writes us and even the haters, by the way. I mean, I always like getting the hate mail because people take effort and initiative to to write criticisms and to say how much they don't like it, which I love, by the <laughs> way, because it means you're engaged. If you, The worst thing is when people don't care. Do you know what I mean? Right, right, and right. so the fact mm-hmm. that people are engaged is what we really love most. But the world's changed now. And when we started this podcast back in 2010, Cobus and I, we, we had this idea that we were interested in this topic and we weren't sure if anybody else was. So we figured... Why don't we just talk about it just for us to pass time talking about these things? And we thought, okay, after three or four months, maybe five months tops, we're going to run out of things to talk about. Well, we certainly didn't run out of things to talk about because 2010 was the kind of, if you look back at the trajectory of China's engagement in the global South, in Africa, part of the going out, all of this, this was the precursor and the run up to the Belt and Road, you know, things were just ramping up big time. But what we've seen over the past couple of years, particularly since the beginning of the pandemic, but trends that have been underway since 2017, 2018, is that China's been changing its strategies. Yeah. And we started running out of content, literally running out of content focused exclusively on Africa, in part because China was now expanding far beyond Africa into the Middle East, into South America, into Central Asia. And what we saw was that it was counterproductive to just look at Africa in isolation of what was happening in the other regions. Hmm. And so much of what the Chinese are doing in Africa is transnational in nature, BRI, Huawei, COVID, debt, you name it. And so just looking at one piece of the puzzle, we felt misses a lot. And so we kind of sat back and we said, well, there's been this disengagement from Africa to some extent by the Chinese because of the the need now to to expand their presence in other parts of the world. So we had to do it out of necessity. And then we thought, this is where the story is evolving. And this is where there's a massive, gaping, giant hole in the discourse looking at what the global South is and, in, and its importance to China. Yeah. And we'll look at why that hole is there and what efforts there have been to, to try to fill it. Uh, Cobus, you guys have really grown even in just the last couple of years since joining our network of new sources of funding. You've got new staff. I understand you've got, what, nine or ten people now on nine staff. Nine people, yes. But also uh, the expanded mission, which we've just talked about, but also programming in Arabic and in French. And uh, along with us, you've got a new name. You know, you went from the China Africa Project to uh, the China Global South Project. Also, we like the word project as well. Kobus, tell our listeners about the China Global South Project, and, and maybe you can introduce some of your team members who we'll be hearing from in the newsletter, uh, your excellent, excellent newsletter. By the way, you guys should be subscribing to that newsletter. It's just fantastic. Uh, we've actually taken a, a page from it, That I mean, sometimes literally, but I, I love the design of the thing. I love the flow of it. It's a fantastic newsletter. T- tell us about what's, what's new from the China Global South Project. Yes, so so our newsletter is is speeding ahead, um, and we expanded its its focus to look at the at, at China's engagement with the whole global South, with Africa at its center. You know, so our work is always going to be Africa centric, and Africa is is to our mind the the heart of the global South. But we we increasingly take a, a comparative perspective between between what's happening in Africa and elsewhere, and connecting dots which, between them and showing similar trends popping up in in in, in many places around around the global South. So. We got uh, we got funding um, to expand our work into French and Arabic, which is which is really exciting for us, you know, particularly in African space. And so we're putting out French and Arabic newsletters, um, edited by our colleagues uh, Jean Nima and Nesrin Kamal. And we're also now moving into French and Arabic language podcasting. So you know, kind of they're coming they're coming out, you know, with slightly bigger kind of gaps between them. But but we we're, we're really excited to kind of move into this French and Arabic podcasting space because to a large extent it's, it's very fresh. There's there's very little kind of action there. And we're also very excited to provide all of this this kind of particularly kind of global south wide input on these language in these languages because the discourse in these languages are so dominated by by government media and in the case of French by Paris based media so this is really kind of like an exciting and somewhat scary kind of move for us into you know into uncharted territory <laughs> I have to thank you guys also for you know 
not jokingly saying as one well might that while you guys are running the China Global South podcast, Kaiser, you are running the China Global North podcast. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would probably deserve it. I would probably deserve it. But hey, you know, division of labor, right? But it, but it is if if we can motivate, you know, again, all of the coverage of China to kind of take more into account and look at it more broadly. That would be something fantastic because, again, when you have these conversations in places like Washington, London, Brussels, the conversations that we all have with various stakeholders, it's always just shocking to me how, again, their focus is China, 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 U.S., China, Europe, and that's it. Or they'll look at data from Pew, for example, that looks at all the advanced kind of economies, and that's their kind of framing of the world. Well, that's the international community, right? <laughs> that's the international community. And and what makes us different from everybody else out there in the China-watching community, as far as I can see, and something that I'm extraordinarily proud of, we all live in the global south. We all live in developing countries. I'm in Vietnam. Cobus is in South Africa. We have staff in Egypt, in Kenya, in Mauritius, and in China. And so that is really kind of trying to give a different alternative view to some of these issues than what some of the prevailing narratives are. Your show is essential reading and listening to. I mean, the Access newsletter that, that Jeremy puts together and the show that you have. We want to be essential listening and reading for the complement to what you guys are doing, which is the rest of the world. And you put those two together and you get the complexity of the picture. That's what we're aspiring to. Well, Jeremy and I do both live in the American South. I mean, that helps a little. That's right. Also a developing country, yes. Right, right, right. It, it certainly <laughs> feels that way sometimes. When we talk about the global South, besides obviously sub-Saharan Africa, uh, most people will think of Latin America, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and the Middle East and North Africa. But there are also some geographies that don't come immediately to mind. I'm thinking of Oceania, for example, uh, the South Pacific. What about Central Asia? Does that also fall under your bailiwick? And of course, this I'm asking, you know, on the day that the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meets in Samarkand. Yeah, it, it does. We keep we keep trying to kind of maintain a balance between covering all of the all of these kind of issues that show up in all of these different places at once, and like and showing kind of commonalities, while also being sensitive to certain regions' long historical relationships living very close to China. You know, so of ah, course, okay, good. so of course, that's true for Central Asia, and it's also true for parts of Southeast Asia. And you know, it, like the the experience of 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 being right next to China as a developing country is of course different from being far away from China as a developing country. But you know, the, so, so, so we try to reflect those nuances while also, you know, showing the commonalities between all of them, you know, particularly as a way that they kind of weave together by the Belt and Road. Yeah. So the filters that we use to guide our coverage are basically if it's pure G7 and China, that's not our story. Uh, that we'll leave that to Sinocism. We'll leave that to the China project. There's many places that are covering what you know the U.S. and China are doing. However, Australia is an interesting story, and and they compl they complicate the narrative a little bit because Australia is a very active player in the mining sector. Australia is very active yeah. in the South Pacific. Australia is increasingly active here in Southeast Asia, and so Australia gets kind of sucked into it. Uh -huh. And so the filter for us is really the G77. And we look at, again, the broader view of the global south, so Central America, South America, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, the Indian Ocean Basin, then Western Pacific. Sure. But again, Taiwan is not our story. Lots of places are covering the Taiwan story, but Taiwan and Iswatini is our story. Taiwan and uh, Central America is our story. There was a meeting in Washington where the, the, the Taiwan representative office, you know, gathered together diplomats from Asia, Africa, all of their, you know, their friendly countries around the world, that becomes our story in that sense, too. So again, there's no hard and fast line. But what we try and do is that if there's a story that's mm -hmm, going to be covered mm -hmm. by the China Project, by the New York Times, or by uh, what Bill Bishop is doing over uh -huh. Sinocism, then that's kind of not our, our thing. Sure. We really want to try and, and, and focus on the areas that are undercover, undervoiced. And again, you know, we've got these this great team of editors in, you know, like Kobus and Giro and Nesrin, who bring a different point of view than people living in the US and in Europe. And, and that is really, really important in terms of understanding the sensitivities to it. And so so that's kind of how we approach our, our daily coverage in our podcast. Kobus mentioned just now that there are all sorts of commonalities between, well, I think between not only 
what China is doing in the rest of the global south and what it's been doing in Africa, uh, and also you know what the West has been doing in both of the not doing. the way that it's resp- or not doing and and responding the way that it's responded to China, you know. So there's there's a lot of the same dynamics in play. I'm hearing quite a bit uh, that that echoes Africa and discourse on Africa, same sorts of issues. But surely neither China nor the nations of the global north are just cutting and pasting their approaches uh, to, say, you know, Oceania or Southeast Asia. And obviously, the, the geographies themselves dictate different approaches. Uh, so what, as we go through, I mean, I, what I want to ask you about are, are what some of the, the tropes are, what sort of the characteristics of this discourse has been. But, you know, let's think also about, about where each geography stands out is quite different. But let's, let's talk about this. Um, you know, I, I've been an avid listener, and I've been for for a very long time. Let me let me start with this, uh, Eric. You spent a good part of your summer in Washington D.C. Mm. Uh, not a place you necessarily want to be in the summer. I wasn't should, too I bad, actually. Uh, it wasn't too bad. Well, you're used to Ho Chi Minh City, so I suppose that's that, right. The humidity is not that, too uh, bad. Um, you made the rounds of a lot of think tanks, uh, talked to congressional staffers, yeah. to to people at, at universities. What did you find in terms of their interest in, their awareness of the issues that you cover in your newsletter that you're going to be covering on the new show? What was the level of knowledge and interest? First of all, the interest is off the charts. I've been going to D.C. every summer now for for many years, and never has my schedule Mm -hmm. been this packed. So people are just so keen to talk about it. China is the hot issue, obviously, today. I mean, Russia, Ukraine is another hot issue, but China is right up there as the hot issue. So I, I just loved having the chance to go and to talk to everybody. I was on the Hill. I was in the executive branch. I went to the think tanks. I went to several of the universities, students, scholars, you name it. Every day packed with, with meetings. The big takeaway, and I felt a little bit like Leo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence in, uh, in the Netflix movie, Don't Look Up, where like, you know, the asteroid is coming and you're the guy <laughs> just getting, everyone wants to talk about Britney Spears and you're like, the asteroid is coming. And, uh, you know, and it was just kind of fun where people are like, well, China's a rising power. And you're like, no, no. China just passed the United States and Central America as the largest trading partner. China's <laughs> the largest navy in the world today. China's the number one trading partner in South America. It has the number one trading partner in Southeast Asia. Stop saying it's a rising power. It's here. Right. And, and that mindset that is – China is a main threat for the United States, but in the global south and in the developing world, we still have time. And my message was, no. I mean, yes, the game still may be on, but if the score is 82 to 2 in the fourth quarter with three minutes to play, you don't have a lot of time. Right. And, and my sense more and more is that in many parts of the world, including here in Southeast Asia, it may even be too late for the United States and Europe to catch up. There are many important things that the United States and Europe are doing here. I don't want to be this kind of person who's saying everything that the Chinese are doing in these parts of the world is great, and it's the 10-foot-tall monster, and they're so competent, and they're executing beautifully. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that when your trade volumes are orders of magnitude larger, when you're building infrastructure, when your private companies are engaged and on the ground, and when things are happening— at a pace and speed that they're happening, okay? And this is what we track every day in our, in our daily brief that goes out to, you know, thousands. That's what we're trying to do is to kind of index all the little things that are happening every day. The volume gets to a point where it's difficult to catch up. And we're not, we as Americans, are not coming to the fight with our best tools. We're fighting, we're trying to match them one for one. So the Chinese are building roads. Well, we're going to build roads. Well, we suck at building right. roads. We're not good at building roads. The roads in Washington are freaking terrible. <laughs> 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 okay. I don't know what gets into people's minds that they think they can build a road in Nigeria when we can't build roads in our own country. More importantly, we, we don't have a system that is optimized to compete with the Chinese on speed. So the Chinese will execute in a place like the Congo from the first negotiation to a shovel in the ground in 12 months. We can't do that. We're just not set up for that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so, so I felt like there was a lot of interest. Everybody was saying China's a problem. Everybody was in agreement that China's a problem. We have to do something about China. Nobody, nobody had any consensus on what to do. 
And that, to me, was the most important revelation, that from the Hill to the executive branch to the think tanks to, you know, you name it, corporates, defense contractors, everybody had a different idea, no consensus. There was no organizing principle like what we had during the Cold War with the Kennan documents that everybody could kind of agree on and rally around. And time is running out to get this figured out. The Americans still think that they have the luxury of time. And the kind of the point that I was trying to make is that where I live and where I see it, you don't. Yeah. So what was their ask of you? What were they hoping that you would be able to bring to them then through through this meeting? I mean, were they suddenly signing up for your newsletter in droves? Well, I mean, I, I was literally like, you know, Willie Loman in the, you know, selling insurance and trying to get people to sign up for, for our little humble news service and our website. And it was interesting because so many people were so kind. Eric, you guys are filling a void. You're, you're doing God's work. It's amazing, you know, and so many people were so kind. And then they don't turn around and sign up. And you're like, well, that was kind of surprising to me, you know, given the fact that there's nobody else doing what we do in this space with the intensity with which we're doing it. And given the levels of interest, I'm just constantly, Cobus has to hear me complain almost every day of like, <laughs> why aren't people signing up for this thing? I mean, like, and, and again, I'm so proud of the work that we do, but it's just, and, and Cobus, you, you can speak to this. Let me just kind of put it bluntly. I mean, at the end of the day, people don't give a poop. They don't care. Yeah. They don't think it's that important. And they're going to wake up. And this is what we're seeing in the DRC Right now, we just did a show a couple of weeks ago on this, and we basically said the U.S. is blocked out of the DRC in the mining sector, in part because of neglect, a lack of engagement, and a lack of understanding of the issues. And this is what the consequences of not understanding what the Chinese are doing looks like in reality. Kobus, why don't you kind of speak a little bit to those, to those issues that we talk about every day? Yeah, Kobus, I mean, I want to ask you specifically, what do you think is, is driving this, this abject ignorance. I mean, why is there such a poor grasp of this in Washington? I mean, and really not just Washington. It's and it's not just Washington to be no, fair. It's Brussels. It's yeah, it's all all the a- one 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 point just before we get to Cobus is that one of the points that I'm also very disappointed now looking back on the 12, 13 years that we've been doing this is that Africans aren't taking this seriously either, by the way. Their knowledge, hmm. their China literacy has not improved dramatically in, in, in more than a decade and it's hurting them too. I mean The Ugandan finance minister last year in front of a parliamentary oversight committee said, we didn't understand the contract over the Entebbe airport expansion. That is Hmm. shocking to me in 2021. Yeah, A decade or more into China's engagement in Africa, they're not staffing their ministries with China knowledge and China experts either. So it's not uniquely a a Washington thing too, by the way. So Kobus, over to you. Yeah, Yeah, um, I think there's there's different dynamics that play in in the African problem that Eric raised now and and in the global north. So in in the Africa case, I think one one of the big problems is that African governments tend to be quite old. Right, kind of like the like, even though Africa has the the world's youngest population, um, with many African countries, the 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 average age is is you know kind of nineteen, seventeen, you know, kind of like this. It's a continent of teenagers, but they have the the world's oldest leaders. So, um, and you know, frequently, you know, the the hiring practices and the hiring pipelines in in Africa particularly into government ministries are really messed up. So that's one of that's one of the big problems. Like so you have the talent on the ground, you have a lot of African students who've studied in China, you have a lot of African students who speak Mandarin and they frequently can't get jobs and they particularly can't get government jobs. So um so it's that that's a problem in in terms of, of job pipelines and 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 kind of and political culture in Africa. So in the in terms of the global north, I think the problem is that that they I think they just got used to things being a certain way. I think you know kind of I think they just got kind of used to the global the global south Occupying its position, you know, kind of like, in, and and kind of working, working with it, working with these global South countries in particular ways that they've now set up whole architectures to do, you know, kind of. So those are 
aid, particularly, and you know, kind of with with many aid agencies working with governments, you know, to, and 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 producing really like providing really important services, you know. So it's not not to kind of dis, you know, for example, something like PEPFAR. I'm sorry, what what something like what? Oh, sorry, PEPFAR is is the the presidential emergency. What is the second people? Presidential emergency fund for AIDS relief. Yes. So uh-huh. it's it's it was a real game changer that came in under the the Bush administration. Bush forty three. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. And uh, that really changed the, the kind of HIV scene in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. It, was, it really did a lot. You know, so, so there are these kind of like legacy projects and this kind of a legacy way of thinking about the global south. But there's a lack of interest or a lack of kind of like, like mental energy, I think, in terms of reconceptualizing how the global south is viewed. And this is this is particularly true, I think, in the corporate space, you know, in in the global north. And so, so you know, kind of, I've had very interesting conversations with American diplomats who are, who are working so hard to try and get American companies into the mining, back into the mining sector in, in the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, because the Chinese are really, really occupy most mm. of that space now. And these are um, for for people who don't follow this issue. The, the Congo has the largest repository of strategic minerals that are used for rechargeable. Batteries. Well, there's cobalt and there's um, coal tan. Yeah, and, cobalt yeah. and 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 lithium, tan, tantalum, and, and and so on. So so. 80% of the world's cobalt is now refined in China. And all of these American companies like Tesla, like Ford and so on, are making deals, these massive deals with Chinese battery makers in order to buy their batteries and source them from China. So all of these American diplomats are working so hard to try and get American companies into the DRC, but the American companies are not interested. You know, kind of, they it's it's a difficult place to do business. You know, kind of, they 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 worried about kind of getting involved in corruption scandals. Um, you know, so they're just not playing ball. And with that comes um, a kind of an unwillingness to imagine a different way of dealing with the global south, which is happening at a moment when China is completely upending, you know, kind of how, how like how it does business with, with, the, with, with the whole of the global south. You know, so one of, one of the things that, that, that was very interesting about the Ukraine crisis was the surprise in Washington when a whole bunch of like almost half of African countries abstained from the vote condemning Russia's invasion. You know, and suddenly there was all of these conversations with with diplomats being like, "But why?" You know, kind of like, "What? You know, what? What lies behind this thinking?" You know, why aren't they just simply falling into 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 formation with us when we are so clearly right? You know, so it's that kind of thinking. Well, let me ask you about that specifically. Then, you know, why are they? I mean, I think this is a theme that I've picked up on over the years, uh, listening to you guys' show and reading your newsletters. It seems like you, you've put your finger on something important, which is that. Westerners seem time and again to be surprised by the intensity of you know, the resentment, by the unresolved issues left over from colonialism, which was you know not very long ago. I mean, this seems particularly odd given that the global South itself can practically be defined as that part of the world that experienced you know the pointy end of colonialism itself. But is that what you would chalk this up to? I mean, what, yet another instance of, wait, wait, why are they not falling in line behind us here? I mean, it couldn't possibly be that they resent the history of, of Western imperialism, could it? I think, I think for, you know, kind of for, for a lot of these people in the West, they, um, for them, colonialism feels very long ago. And of course, you know, kind of they, they also, there's also a, a, a real kind of like deficit of information about how, what happened immediately after colonialism. You know, like in the process of colonialism, of decolonization, and then the kind of new imperial kind of projects that, that happened during the Cold War. Because there's, there's relatively little kind of discussion about, for example, like, like US and Belgian intervention in the Congo in the, in the 60s and 70s. There is very there's quite low levels of, of of knowledge about that I think among among many Americans and Europeans, so it just for them feels a long time ago and like people should have gotten over it you know, but in reality the daily life in these countries are still fundamentally shaped by that that experience among others because of systemic underdevelopment that that was a part of the colonial you know project. Um, that still mean that you the means that it takes you ten hours to get to to travel three hundred kilometers from you know kind of from one city to another in in your choose your global south country. Those things are still a reality. So you know, for example, like the U.S. in I'm, I'm old. I'm like I'm like I'm forty eight, <laughs> right? Kind of, but like 
I remember as a child, my uncle being sent to Angola as part of a kind of a new imperial kind of pro, you know, kind of like initiative that was funded by the US and that, that and, and where funds, funds were kind of channeled via apartheid South Africa into you know, kind of anti-communist containment in Angola. And they were, they like, these were like white South African soldiers, apartheid soldiers, looking at Luanda across the hill and, and you know kind of and, and and then kind of like getting messages from both Pretoria and Washington about how they should proceed like this is you know th- th- these are these are living memories um you know and and they're living they're much more starkly living in you know kind of for many other people like you know kind of the for example the the fight that that's still going on at the moment between between the DRC and Belgium to try and kind of get the tooth from Patrice Lumumba, the, the the liberation leader that was that was assassinated by by CIA and Belgian forces, to, to get that tooth repatriated from Belgium back to the DRC. That's just you know kind of this like really kind of gross and weird like little little lawsuit that's going on between the DRC and Belgium around around these issues is just this kind of symbol of this kind of thing reverberates across the world and you know kind of in 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 many many different ways and we saw it now with the twitter reaction to queen elizabeth ii's death you know with with britons being appalled by by people in the caribbean for example you know kind of cheering at at her passing so it's still living memory and and still a, a living reality for people in the global south and it's kind of been completely wiped you know kind of in 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 the global north and particularly the global north interactions with the global south frequently don't reflect that reality Eric, maybe you could you could talk a little bit about how China benefits from it, uh, insofar as it does. Uh, whether China might, if it isn't careful, also maybe end up activating some of that same resentment. So China is activating some of that same resentment. But let's start mm-hmm. with one side of this again. And everything that we talk about when we talk about China and Africa, and China and the global South, and, and this is again true for China writ large, is. It's always confusing. And if you walk away with thinking that you understand it, I mean, Kaiser, you and I have been doing China affairs and and, and looking and, and, and committing ourselves to this country now going on four decades, three or four decades. And I sure. still feel like I don't know what's going on. So so again, the contradictions live side by side one another. So let's start with the the positive side and in terms of how the Chinese benefit from this. So I was just having a conversation today with a Kenyan scholar who asked me legitimately, he says, do the Americans lecture the Saudi Arabians on LGBT issues the same way they'd lecture the Kenyans? <laughs> that was a legitimate question because he was perplexed that this is constantly an issue when secretaries of state go to Africa and go to East Africa in particular, and LGBT issues become paramount. Now, all of us agree that LGBT rights and LGBT safety and inequality are, are critical issues. What people see, though, is an inconsistency that makes it to the point of unbelievable. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. interests are subject to circumstance or principles are subject to circumstance is the rule of the day here. That is, when Anthony Blinken goes to Algeria two weeks after or three weeks after the invasion – and once shows up saying, we're not going to talk about just transition. We're not going to talk about green energy. My white friends in Germany now need natural gas. And remember that up until now, they've been talking about all these things about carbon neutrality, how Africa needs to transition away from fossil fuels. But all of a sudden, when the white people in Germany and Europe face going cold, African fossil fuels become very attractive. The debate in Congress this past week over billions of dollars in aid for Egypt, even though Egypt is a non-democratic country, is does not fit any of the requirements that the Americans have for you know their pro-democracy clubs, human rights, uh, governance, democracy, participation, you name it. There's so many things that Egypt comes up wrong, they still get the checks, okay? Uh, the Saudis being another example of this. And that inconsistency right. is so jarring. But let me just point this out. In January, when Wang Yi went to Kenya, former president Uru Kenyatta, it's weird to say that, he's just Mm -hmm. now only a couple days former president, he literally, to the camera, (laughs) said, we don't need lectures. Now, here's the problem. Former president Kenyatta's comments were never picked up by the AP or by Reuters or by CNN or by BBC. It's never covered, okay? 
When Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, was here in Vietnam, the main talking point out of the state media was, we are embracing Russia because they're the only member of the P5 that has not invaded Vietnam. That was their line. And I was like, that's pretty interesting. Hmm. <laughs> so to Kobus's point, these resentments are raw and near the surface. And Americans and Europeans, because of our ignorance of the histories, in our lifetimes, gentlemen, our lifetimes, okay, colonialism was alive in the 70s. I mean, this sure. is not something that is ancient history only in black and white movies. It's in our lifetimes, and yet we pretend as if it's this, you know, long ago. And when the king of Belgium went to the Congo earlier this year, couldn't apologize because he knows if he apologizes, it opens up massive litigation for compensation. Okay, it's this. And listen, Kobus, we're having the same problem in the United States about our own history with slavery. It's no different. But the resentments are there and are deep. And when we don't acknowledge those, the Chinese come in and say, guess what? We were colonized. We were exploited. We had the centrifugal emulation by the same jerks who did this to you. And that is a very, very important point of bonding. The Chinese will also say, and we've interviewed a number of Chinese diplomats on the show, we've never invaded another country. We've never launched foreign wars. Again, sitting here in Vietnam, that's an awkward fact for them. <laughs> very rich. <laughs> because, yeah. in fact, the last war that the Chinese did it actually it was an, un, an unprovoked invasion of, of Vietnam in 1979. And when we, we spoke with Ambassador Huang Ping about that, he got uncomfortably quiet. Yeah, I remember um, that. The funny thing is the Chinese are as naive and ignorant about their history as we are about ours because they've completely scrubbed their history clean of all the inconvenient truths as well. So let's talk about the negative side now. So the Chinese are profiting from the fact that they do have this shared history of colonialism and subjugation at the hands of the West and, well, the Japanese as well. Now, the negative side is we're starting to see the same kind of arrogance from the Chinese in places like Africa, where it is very much a top-down relationship. The Chinese have never had to make any concessions to, to satisfy Africa. Not one that I can think of. Kobus, can you think of, a, of any concession to a Chinese interest that the Chinese have ever had to make for Africa. They won't relent on the debt. They're not relenting on, on anything. There's never a concession or a compromise that's made from the Chinese side. Never any debt restructuring, nothing? Well, they, nothing they restructure, like but they never cancel. Do you know what I mean? Right. And they're just now the cancellations, the zero interest loans. We just got a report that came out this week from Boston University. A lot has been made about that. Those zero interest loans account for 1%, and those are grants. That's not the commercial and concessional loans. They're just about to face some reality in Zambia, but they still haven't done it yet. Mm -hmm. And so there's an arrogance in some of the Chinese rhetoric. We're starting to see Chinese mass media replicate some of the most horrific caricatures and stereotypes of black people and of Africans, uh, and not just once, but multiple times. Sure, uh, sure, you sure. You hear this didactic approach to the Chinese that says, we know better, we're going to tell you what you should do. Uh, they come and say we're equals and we're brothers, but at the same time, they will say, well, you know, replicate our special economic zone model, replicate our party model, replicate so many of our things, which really don't translate well outside of China. They, those are unique to the Chinese system. And, and so we're seeing, again, some of these patterns start to repeat themselves, and the Chinese certainly are going to be vulnerable. And one of the things that we've, we heard from Joseph Asunka, who is the CEO of Afrobarometer, is that a lot of Chinese popularity in Africa and favorable public opinion comes from the fact that people see the infrastructure that they're building. But the Chinese now right. are more or less pulling out of the large-scale infrastructure space. So they're going to have to compete more now on ideas and soft power and public diplomacy, which is not their strong suit by any measure. This idea of infantilization has been a big theme. I know that that uh, when I've had like Nzetsuwera on the show, that's it's something she she uh, highlights uh, this tendency to deny agency or accountability to the nations of the global south uh, on the part of the West and. Yeah, I mean, of course, as you say, China is is not entirely innocent of that either. But you know, just now you talked about the Entebbe Airport deal and how Ugandans had failed to sort of understand the terms of it. Do you feel like 
<laughs> this is this is a difficult question to ask. Do you feel like the infantilization sometimes is not entirely undeserved? No. No, Cobus, you go ahead. I mean, I've got a lot to say on that, but you go ahead. You know, I think I think what it frequently is is is, is that in some ways, I think African governments are just as used to the kind of current system as as European and American governments are. You know, I think I think they like they a lot of a lot of their their kind of choices in terms of who to hire and who to appoint um, in particular positions have to do with experience or, or capacity in dealing with a very set up system like which includes particularly the dealing with the world bank dealing with with aid aid architectures and and you know kind of and so on um so so there's this you know africa has a lot of capacity gaps and this then happens to be one of them um but also what you know kind of what what comes with that is that the chinese you know the the Chinese really come to the table prepared, and and one and one one of those kind of forms of preparation is that they frequently come to large scale loan negotiations with Western law law firms. So you know, kind of they and and frequently they 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 come with people who are who are very versed at 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 kind of like using the lang- the kind of le- like Western kind of legal precedent and Western legal language. To to kind of to structure deals very aggressively for transnational clients. You guys just uh, shared with me a, a really great piece by Matienzia in his uh, newsletter slash website, Panda Paw and Dragon Claw. And that's yeah. all about this, exactly what you're talking about, the sort of vicissitudes of China's expanding global presence. That, that newsletter is great. He had that piece that was, you know, it provided a first person account of an XM banker experience in negotiating a loan for, for um, the new Chinese built airport in Nepal. And he was really impressed with the sort of aggressiveness uh, and the the savvy of the Nepali negotiators that were across the table from him. Is that an example of what you're talking about? Yes, yes. It's you know kind of when when these these um, these governments kind of get it together to to really to really kind of be strategic and be very hard nosed, and they don't you don't have ministries fighting amongst each other. You don't have you know people undermining each other in order to 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 get ahead. They they really have a comprehensive kind of like like strategy. For example, for Lashare Sule, like who's a, who's a, a, a researcher um, at Oxford, has shown that the government of Benin has been very successful in, in in doing this kind of thing, where they really kind of pull together all of their resources, you know, kind of throw all of their kind of technocrats at the Chinese, and then and 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 be willing to to not be held to a timetable. They're willing to kind of stretch it out those those negotiations out as long as it needs. To take, which is what the Nepalis also did, um, and so you know, kind of so so when you have these kind of governments, the, the governments acting in this way, then then they 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 do gain a lot of agency. They do kind of like draw, kind of drive a much tougher bargain. The problem is, I think that that in a lot of cases, and you see this in in in, in intra African, you know, kind of uh, dynamics as well, is that there's a lot of a lot of kind of um, Turf protecting, kind of happening with within government agencies, or between government agencies, between different individual, you know, kind of bureaucrats, and and frequently corruption plays a role there too, um, you know. So so it, it it's not necessarily that there isn't capacity; it's that the capacity isn't being wielded because it's being undercut, um, and so um, you know, so and, and and that that kind of adds to the problem, and and you see that by the way, you see that across the global south. It's not only in Africa. Um, you know, very similar kind of problems in 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 Latin America, in in the Caribbean, and and so on. So you know, so so it is frequently a situation where where global South countries end up being their own worst enemy. You know, and then and then kind of like outside actors kind of step in, and things are made very convenient for them. You know, kind of much much too convenient for them. So Eric, you know, maybe you have some something to add to this. It would be equally preposterous to assume sort of uh, an inherent wisdom and, and total sort of maturity and savvy on the part of, of all state actors of the global south. Uh, it would be as foolish as it would be to deny it altogether, right? Uh, it's a very complicated picture. What, what, what do you have to add to that? It, it, that's right. It's inconsistent at best. And, and by the way, the misreading of the Chinese by many people in Africa and governments in South America mirrors the misreading that we in the U.S. have made for decades. You've talked about on your show about Jim Mann and the China Fantasy, that, that book, what, came out 10 years ago? 
and mm-hmm. and we mm-hmm. have a rich think tank culture, academic culture, China analyst culture, all, I mean, thousands of people who have way more knowledge on this than we do as a society, feeding up ideas into the policymaking, and we still struggle with it. So I think it's very important to put that this is not unique to developing countries. However, the picture in developing countries is very, very mixed. And that's one of the reasons why it's bad to say Africa, it's bad to say South America, it's bad to say the global South, because as Fulashade Sule points out, as in Wary point out, a number of, of great scholars point out, there are some fantastic examples of, of agency that are being exacted and being used and negotiating great deals and pushing the Chinese really hard, okay? So it, it, you know, avoid these kind of broad brush kind of characterizations and generalizations. I will say something here, though, that Director General Wu Peng told us. Uh, he's the top diplomat for Africa and the Chinese foreign ministry. Right. Nobody is putting a gun to anybody's head to take these deals. Okay, and this is where the infantilization comes in. And Cobus makes this point over and over again, that oftentimes when we hear the criticisms of Chinese lending by Western stakeholders, the equation that they have is not take a better deal from the European or, or from the, the Americans. It's either Huawei or nothing. It's either the China Exim Bank or nothing. And when you are staring down the right. double barrel shotgun of demographics that African countries are, all African countries, the fastest growing continent, median age, 19.4 years old, you don't have the luxury of time. So the Americans come waltzing along and saying, don't take this deal. And if you're country leader X, Y, or Z, you say, what am I supposed to do? Where does the money come from? Now, in the case of Kenya, and this is a great example here, okay, this is where all of the frustration of civil society, and Kobus has spoken to this many, many times about the gap between the ruler and the ruled in many African countries, and that the accountability just isn't there. Kenya has a procurement law that requires that all contracts be made public. The High Court of Mombasa in May of this year ordered that the Standard Gauge Railway contract be released and made public. Civil society activists took the government to court and said, we're going to sue you for to be able to see this Chinese contract. Still haven't seen it. And what about the port? I mean, is that contract now being made? That's all part of the Standard Gauge Railway tr- contract. Okay. Oh, it's all, okay. The port we of haven't Mombasa seen it. Part of that. The High Court of Mombasa right. ordered its release. Still not released. Shame wow. on the Kenyan government for that. The Kenyan people have a right to be angry about this. And this is this accountability. So the governance question in Africa deserves accountability. And this is where agency swings both ways. And, th- and by only focusing on the Chinese, the West, I mean, I've never heard the State Department criticize African governments for, for, for not doing their part in these Chinese deals. It's always the Chinese are predatory lenders. Lord, if I hear Linda Thomas Greenfield talk about predatory lending one more time, I'm going to blow my head. <laughs> it is just, I mean, it's just ridiculous because it, and this is the infantilization. We have an obligation to make sure that we hold the Chinese to account for what they're doing that is irresponsible, but also at the same time, the Kenyan government has things to answer for as well. Kobus, you wanted to add something? Just this is a you know little bit of context. You know the the Chinese were particularly in the and now I'm speaking about the infrastructure development field particularly. The Chinese were latecomers to to this field, right? Kind of so so by the time that they arrived, um, it was really deep into a kind of a fifteen year, ten fifteen years into a, a, a you know kind of a, a unipolar kind of like consensus on Western leadership. You know, where where essentially Western lenders, Western you know development partners were the only game in town, except for the Japanese, and they were they were very much kind of on board, you know, kind of with with that kind of thinking. Which means that that these countries' development decisions were completely dependent on fashions of thinking within within these within these institutions. You know, kind of so so the World Bank funded infrastructure for you know for a few decades and then there was a turn like an anti-infrastructure turn within the you know kind of within the world bank and a shift towards ideas of like for example funding civil society you know and and you know kind of like then the need like a, a different a different conceptions of of the role of infrastructure uh, in development so these countries just had had no choice but to kind of fall in line with whatever the kind of fashion was at that moment in Western institutions because there were no other options. Um, and so when once the Chinese arrived, that suddenly opened up all of these like these other options, right. problematic as they are. 
you know um and so a lot of a lot of these african countries ended up kind of going with some problematic deals because they felt that they had no choice and you know kind of like you could spend 5 years applying for for a world bank loan that would then not come through you know so, so and and then your whole your whole political legacy has been staked on that on that project so so a lot of them kind of bit the bullet and went with the chinese you know kind of because that was that was the, their only option and then inherited a bunch of problems because they didn't necessarily have they didn't develop the capacity to do that that kind of hard negotiation that they needed to do because they had the only capacity they had was in negotiating with the world bank so you know so so that kind of that kind of like unipolar western kind of like power model ended up kind Kind of replicating itself all over the world, you know, and 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 China ended up disrupting that model, but disrupting it in very kind of chaotic ways, you know, kind of like like that ended up being quite kind of costly in many ways, you know, kind of across the global south. I think the two of you have really established pretty well that you are not unalloyed cheerleaders for China's every initiative. No. There's plenty of criticism of no. China coming up, uh, but you know, as we all know, you know, China and Chinese companies they can be. Well, you know, ignorant and ethnocentric and, and terribly, terribly bigoted. Uh, but one thing that, that I do want to talk about is the way that they can also be very cavalier about the impact of projects on indigenous peoples, uh, or of course on the biodiversity of, of the different ecologies in which they operate in. So do you want to talk a little bit about, I mean, will your show, uh, on the Global South be looking at a, a lot of environmental impact. In fact, we're we're hiring a dedicated full-time reporter to look at China climate in the global south starting this fall. Oh, fantastic. Just to dedicate yeah. exclusively to that to these issues of and again, and and the reporter is we're only going to hire a woman to do this job because women suffer disproportionately effects of climate change and women's voices and girls' voices are not represented in this discourse anywhere near enough. The, the Chinese, again, and the Chinese have this, this stock excuse that they use whenever they are involved in a project that is environmentally destructive. They say, well, we're just doing it what the host government wanted to do. So we, we don't intervene in the internal affairs of other countries. If the host government wants to put a giant hydroelectric dam right, right in the middle of an indigenous community in a protected rainforest, well, that's what they want to do. Uh, that is not a responsible stakeholder. And China wants to have it both ways. They want to have this global leadership role in the sustainability discourse. And at the same time, then they basically say, well, we don't interfere in internal affairs in, in decisions of other countries. So that's number one. That contradiction needs to be addressed. There is a sense among Chinese scholars, stakeholders, think tanks, and even political actors that that's not sustainable anymore. And they're placing a higher priority now in their feasibility process on environmental considerations. So that'll be interesting to see. The team at Boston University Global Development Policy Center, they have this fantastic interactive database yeah, that looks yeah. at the impact of Chinese finance on indigenous communities around the world. I highly recommend that people go and check that out. We are going to leverage a lot of that data in our coverage of China and climate issues. The other part that we focus more and more now is on the climate crisis in China itself and the impact that it's having on the global south. Hmm. Okay. So, and this is a, a very, this is what's been, I've been writing about this just for the past couple of weeks, but we've seen now the fact that the, the wheat crisis and the, the drought in China, I didn't realize that China was the largest wheat producer in the world. China also has the largest stockpiles of wheat in the world. Wow. When China starts running low on food, they're going to buy as much food as they need to satisfy their people, regardless of the impact that it has on poor developing countries who are now struggling to get food. Yeah. And so, and given the size of China, it has ramifications that extend right throughout the world. So number one is we have to watch on food. Number two, water is going to be critical because the Chinese have built up hydroelectric systems to power many of their largest cities. Chengdu, Chongqing, picking your city is all based on hydroelectric, a lot of it. Which is just literally dried up. Yeah. It's literally just gone. What are they going to do? And I don't think it's politically tolerant for Xi Jinping right now, given the political sensitivities that he's facing right now, to have people cold this winter. So they're going to start smoking whole bunches of coal. And that's yeah. going to, given the scale that they're operating at, that's going to have an impact on the global south. Number one, it's going to force the price of fossil fuels up. They're going to start buying oil up. So fuel and food are already a crisis in many poor countries. And when the Chinese go out into the markets and start gobbling up so much more, that's going to make the costs even higher for poor countries. 
And then at the same time, we're going to start seeing really big winners. So in Brazil right now, they're starting to export large quantities of corn. They're going to export large quantities of, uh, of soybeans. Uh, again, the Chinese want to offset some of their food insecurities that they've had. We know the history of food insecurity in China. This is not yeah. something that Xi Jinping wants to face right now. The impact on that is also very important because there, and we just saw a report today out of Indonesia and South America about the amount of rainforest and protected forest that have been cleared for agriculture. A lot of that is export-bound agriculture, oftentimes that goes to China. So the impacts are felt all over the world. That's what we're trying to look at is when something happens in China, what is the impact in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and elsewhere? Uh, water, again, for me here in Vietnam, living on the Mekong River is also another big concern because they've dammed mm-hmm, up mm-hmm. quite a the bit. The headwaters of which are, yeah, uh, yeah. Of that. So again, the ramifications can be felt all over the place. And that's that's going to be a big part of our coverage and is a big part of our coverage. Mm, I mean, I have to admit, I, I sometimes, you know, like I, I, I take I, I take all of these points, um, but I also have hesitations about the kind of villainization of monsterization of Chinese consumption, right? Kind of like it's, it's something that, that is always fascinating for me like how you know kind of how frequently you know kind of like people who write about this tends to put these kind of these they use like you know it's china's appetite for 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 coal it's china's ravenous for coal china's you know this kind of like this this kind of like scare narrative about you know kind of about about well, it's the scale it's the scale but but per capita chinese consumption is still a lot lower than you know kind of than than in in you know kind of than many parts of the global north so um so the, but but the reality of china is that china is so big as a market that whatever whatever decision whatever kind of like trend or fashion runs through the Chinese market, it has these kind of global ramifications, you know? So for example, like, like there is this traditional Chinese medicine that's, that's right. a kind of a gelatine that's made from boiling down donkey skins. Small, like it's, it's used, it's, it's, it's used, you know, kind of like it's, you know, like as a tonic, um, you know, kind of by, by a small, like a fraction of the of the Chinese traditional you know, kind of medicine kind of market in China, but that fraction was enough to kind of wipe out donkey populations around the world. You know, um, so it's it's simply it's simply a, you know kind of it's, it's it's a it's one it's the scale, b it's 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 the 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 impact of Chinese China's own history, right? Kind of because I mean. China's incredible development history is, you know, you, it's, it's essentially the idiom you can't make an omelette without breaking some eggs writ on the largest scale that you can imagine, you know. Um, it's like the world's biggest omelette with many, many broken eggs around it, you know. It's like, um, and, you know, yeah. and, and, and that logic, the, the, the people who are producing these, so providing these services around the world who are building these dams around the world are people who came up through that system. That is what they know, you know. So, so um, and then the the kind of the... I recently did um, several projects, like research projects, um, focus on ESG implementation on Chinese infrastructure projects around, like in, in in Africa, and then comparatively between Africa and Southeast Asia. And one of the things that that became very clear there is that is that like many multinationals. They want to, they want to save money and they want to, they want to kind of avoid complication and they want to, they want to stay close to the letter of the law in the recipient countries. Problem is in many of these countries, the letter of the law is pretty weak. Um, and you know, kind of so, so you see these interesting moments where, for example, there's a Chinese company did, did two projects in, you know, kind of in, in very similar countries. Um, one that was found financed by the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and one that was not. And this is the same company, like that, the, almost similar, almost identical projects. But the, the AIB finance one, because AIB is quite quite hardcore in terms of putting out standards, were at much higher standards than the than the one that was not funded by AIB, and that was that 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 was simply according to the letter of the local recipient country law, which was quite weak. You know, so so in that sense, you know, kind of like what one sees a lot in in all of these problems is the weakness in capacity in in recipient government. The recipient governments and the kind of cravenness in you know kind of in, in in decision making you know kind of the selling out of local communities by some middle manager you know um, like a lot of those kind of problems and these countries are, have very low capacity in 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 kind of guarding against against those mal- malpractices and Chinese companies frequently either don't care or they frequently legitimately 
don't know or don't have any pro- or any real power to change it anyway because the project is being managed by some kind of special purpose company joint venture company you know so 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 it becomes very complicated to to kind of to assign blame so i tend to think that the chinese tend to adjust their level of compliance with esg and corruption depending on the level of governance in the country they're operating in so for example we don't hear these problems in sweden and singapore even in the United States, you don't hear it that much. Right. But you hear about it in the DRC, in Gambia, in Gabon, in other places with low governance and weak governance. And so they're highly flexible. So there is not, a again, a one-size-fits-all. They and, and even one company like Sino Hydro, for example, pick any of the big state-owned enterprises, will operate in one country, say Singapore, one way, and in you know the Republic of Congo in a totally different way. And they're highly dynamic that way. And so, again, there's not, it, it's very complex in terms of the understanding of it. Speaking of things that are determined largely by the robustness of, of governance, uh, I've often wondered from the point of view of smaller nations in the global south, it must be tempting to try to extract concessions from competing powers, uh, but at the same time to try to avoid becoming a mere pawn in a great power you know, struggle where you really do lose agency. Uh, what are some examples, <laughs> you guys can both chime in here, uh, of countries that have navigated this this tension well and maybe others that have maybe done less well in this regard? Well, I'm laughing only because if you are a small developing country and you don't feel that you're getting sufficient attention from the United States, either in form of ambassadors, money, you name it, my advice, and this is free advice, is just say that we're thinking of hosting a Chinese military base in our country. <laughs> and holy crap, money will start <laughs> raining down from heaven on you. So it's incredible. So Cambodia, Solomon Islands, Equatorial yeah. Guinea, the attention yeah, that yeah. those countries have been able to get just by saying, well, maybe the Chinese might be here with a military base. Uh, that being said, countries that have done it really, really well. Kenya, in particular, has played the game exceptionally well. I was going to uh, say, They, yeah, at yeah. the same time, have very strong relationship with the United States, negotiating a free trade uh, agreement, strong military ties. Uh, they've, you know, they've really been able to foster that. They also do some of this, well, we're going to turn to our Chinese friends if you, you know, don't play nice with us. They do that very well. They've also engaged Europe very well. Kenyan avocados and Kenyan agriculture go into Europe very strongly. And then it's one of China's most important countries in, in all of Africa, and they've played that relationship so crucial. So Kenya, in many ways, I think, is one of the, 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 the best African countries for doing it. South Africa, where Cobus is, also does a very good job on this. Uh, here in Asia, Vietnam is, is particularly skilled at, at playing this game, at, at hedging. This is what Ryan Haas talked about in his book about how developing countries are, are constantly hedging, blocking and things like that. And, and that whole dynamic. And I think Vietnam is really, I think that they've, they've done very well. And this goes back to your first question about Ukraine. And again, when the musical chairs stop, and the music always stops, okay, they don't want to be left standing up. And if they pick a side, for example, in Ukraine, they abandon the Russians and take the Americans, they're going to get screwed when the music stops. If they take the Russians and abandon the Americans, they're going to get screwed when the music stops. So it's in their strategic interest to be able to to hedge. And, And that's what we're seeing more and more. And again, this is the game in South Pacific right now. This is what's in motion. Penny Wong, the foreign minister of Australia, is making trip after trip after trip now. And they're playing this game exceptionally well, I think, in many countries. And as a group, they're actually behaving as a block. This is where Africa is also different than many other parts of the world. They tend to vote as blocks, maybe not as an entire continent, but as large blocks at the UN, at multilateral organizations. And if they can start to coordinate more, and this is the pan-Africanism that we've been dreaming about for decades, but if they can start to, to really come together now on more cohesive regional policies, be able, they can have some real leverage against the Americans, Europeans, Russians, Chinese, and the emerging powers. The problem is, is that the you know, it's in the first place, it, it, you know, kind of it's a simple thing, but or it sounds simple, but you, you, in order to do that effectively, you have to have a very clear vision of what you want. It's hard. Right? right. In in a lot of detail. And frequently governments don't necessarily have that. They, they have certain ideas of what would be nice to have or what would be convenient, but they don't necessarily have very close, very, very kind of clear ideas about if you have to choose between 
if you can only choose one out of five pieces of infrastructure, which one is going to like really boost your development? For example, right? Kind of like that, that, that kind of like hard nosedness is they frequently don't necessarily have. And, and Nigeria's priorities and Malawi's priorities are radically different in that sense too. So they're, they're not aligned either. Sure. Well, there's, a, there's your other problem is that in order to, to get anything real done for these, for these countries, you need a regional or, you know, kind of perspective, not a, a country perspective. And this is particularly true for issues like climate climate change mitigation and the kind of massive infrastructure that's going to be needed to, to, to help global South countries deal with climate change is they need to work together on a level they never have. Um, they need to kind of like put aside differences between them that frequently are a lot more kind of alive and salient to them than their relationships with these, like, these great powers. Um, and they also, they also need to then extract more money from the global North than the global North has ever imagined giving anyone. Right. In order to, in order to kind of like to, 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 to kind of make these kind of climate, climate, get them over the hump of, of, of actually surviving climate change. You know, so, so, so that is, it's, it's a kind of unprecedented challenge, I think, for a lot of them. You know, that, that would take a level of, of coordination that even the European Union would find difficult to, to manage. Well, Kobus von Staden, Eric Olander, it's just been a fantastic hour talking to you guys and uh, congratulations on the new show. We're very, very eager to get it launched and, uh, Please, if you're listening to this show, please subscribe to the China Global South podcast. You can find it on uh, all the major platforms that you listen to a podcast on. So uh, subscribe to that. You will not regret it. And uh, while you're at it, sign up for their fantastic newsletter. It's really, really, really good. Of course, I'm obliged to plug our own. You know, Just to remind everybody that uh, before we go to recommendations, if you do like the work that we do, with the Seneca podcast and, of course, all the other shows in the Seneca network, including the venerable China in Africa podcast and the new China Global South podcast, then the best way that you can help us is to become an access member. That gets you all the good stuff behind our paywall and, of course, the daily access newsletter, which is really, truly worth the price of admission. So help us to keep the lights on so I can continue to interview thoughtful people like Kobus and Eric, and they can continue to do the work that they're doing and to bring you all the rest of our great network shows. All right, guys, I hope you've got a good recommendation, Andy, because I, I have to scramble and think of something because I, I've been doing so many shows recently that I've sort of tapped out all my recommendations, but I'll, I'll come up with something. What do you guys have for us? Eric, why don't you jump in first? So I'm not going to recommend a, a single article or book as you normally do at the end of the show. I'm going to recommend some people for to follow who are the kinds of voices that need to be heard. And we'll put these in the show notes for you. So don't don't think you have to. Re- so first, I'm oh, going to talk about Jude Moore, who's the former Liberian infrastructure public mm-hmm. works minister who's at the Center for Global Development. He's critical on your Twitter list. Spell his name. Uh, Jude, G-Y-U-D-E underscore M-O-O-R-E is his Twitter handle. Uh, he's absolutely essential in, in understanding kind of a, a very pro-African. And this is a guy who sat on the other side of the table from the Chinese in negotiating and, and just has such yeah. a great perspective in, in all of it. I'm also going to recommend Hannah Ryder, uh, the CEO of Development Reimagined. She's she writes quite a bit. One of her staff members is by the name of Ovigwe Egu Egu, and so these are some fantastic voices. And then the last person I'm going to be a little bit self-serving here is our own uh, Jérôme Nima, and you can find him at Christian Jérôme. We'll put again a link to that in the show notes as well. And he also edits our fantastic Afrique Chine both podcast, Twitter feed, and newsletter as well. But these are some fantastic African voices that speak regularly on China's engagement on the continent and and I think just bring a fresh perspective that we don't hear enough of. Good recommendations, all. Uh, all people that I already follow and uh, and am always learning something from. Kobus, what do you have for us? I, I recommend the work of the work of a scholar and, and I'm sure some of some of uh, people other people you've interviewed have also cited her work is um, CK Lee and she's she's she wrote a book called um, The Spectre of Global China which is based on this amazing like field work that she did in the mining sector in Zambia she managed to kind of like make friends with with someone who then became a, a, a high level political leader in Zambia and then managed to kind of like 
wangle her way into the, the, the copper mining sector and did this full ethnography of the copper mining sector in, in Zambia, particularly as um, as it relates to Chinese multinationals. Um, so she recently is is started also work on on a on a contemporary project uh, called the People's Map of China of People's Map of Global China, I think. Um, so she is um, this really kind of interesting. I think she comes from a kind of a Marxist perspective, and she she really does very very interesting work on the on on Chinese capital. She she essentially looks at 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 how at capital flows um, from China into the rest of the world and, and the kind of effects they have, um, particularly on on uh, the the kind of national economies of, of, of resource dependent countries like Zambia. So now that Zambia is going through this very kind of contentious and difficult debt re- restructuring process, so kind of reading reading that book, The Spectre of Global China, I think came out in 2017. It's incredibly prescient, incredibly interesting to read. Like she she like. Like uh, she's, she's one of these ethnographers who you like can't imagine how they do their work. You know, kind of it's just year after year after year of like kind of hanging out with mining executives and like wow. writing down everything they say and so on. So it's like highly recommended. Very very interesting. Oh, that sounds sounds wonderful. I will definitely pick up a copy of that. Thank you guys. That was a lot of fun. Thank <laughs> you. This was. Uh, it's always amazing to be back on the show. We really appreciate it and. Uh, we're just, you know, we're we're a group of super passionate people about this issue. So we hope that folks will come and check out what we're doing and what the, the great work that the team is doing. I think they will. I think they will. Well, congrats one more time, and uh, we'll we'll see you around. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. It's great to speak with you. The discussion continues online. Follow the China Global South Project on Twitter at China GS Project. And share your thoughts on today's show or head over to our website at chinaglobalsouth.com where you can subscribe to receive full access to more than 5,000 articles and podcasts. Once again, that's chinaglobalsouth.com.